Hi everybody, I'm back and I have good news. So let's get right to the good news part of this video. Um, I'm still in remission. I found out my CT and my CT and uh, PET scan results the other day from my oncologist and sure enough, I, I, I did actually crack open the envelope and read them the night before the visit so that I could be prepared and have questions lined up and um you know it, it wasn't really startling news it was good news i am technically still in remission but the pet uptake did did uptake in a couple of places in my body but not like a tumor looking thing so it, he thinks it's inflammation he's referring me to a couple of specialists to have that checked out and i specifically asked him hey am i still in remission and he said yes so, yay, I'm in remission, I'm still celebrating. And I'm just gonna treat it like that. I'm gonna treat it like it's still a celebration because life is too short. And um, on that note, I've also decided that life is too short to not you know, eat off your china and wear your good jewelry and travel and go places and spend a little bit of money, but um, I'm also saving money. I don't want to be a burden to my kids when I live to be 120. So, and that's my plan. So anyway, um, all things in moderation, I guess. But I am wearing my dad's old bolo tie that I had converted into a pendant. And, you know, it's just a Tuesday. It's just a Tuesday. Nothing special going on. I am going to a cooking class this evening for, um, like, plant-based, whole food plant-based cooking, which is what I've been trying to do since about a year ago. And um, I'll tell you a little bit, of, a little story about that some other time. I'll, I'll get sidetracked if I don't keep focused here. I had a plan to talk to everybody about um, empowerment in advocating for yourself because a lot of people my age and older, young people, I don't, I don't know so much. I think young people kind of take everything you know, in stride, and they have a tendency to question more things or look things up on the internet more. Um, people my age and people my mother's age tend to just trust what a doctor says. And so they just say, well, okay, you know, my doctor says I need to do this, then I'm going to do it. And through this cancer journey, I have had the unfortunate experience of having some doctors on my team that I didn't really feel had my best interest at heart. And it it is kind of heartbreaking to think that you can be in that position, but it happens more than we realize and more than we know. But if you're not paying attention to it, you just think, oh, well, he's got my best interest at heart and he's telling me what to do. I have to just go ahead and do it. So the first, I had two doctors that I actually fired. And the first one was the gastroenterologist that diagnosed the, init the initial original tumor. And I had called because I was bleeding. And I mean, this is blunt, this is gross, and this is graphic, but it is what it is. But I, I called and made an appointment and it was kind of a sudden thing. I was like, what the heck is going on? And very alarming. So I, called and tried to make an appointment and um, he called me back and he said, well, um, take the first available appointment and it's probably diverticulosis or internal hemorrhoids or I noted on your chart that you had those at your last colonoscopy and um, that's probably what it is. So you need to just eat. It's, it's probably diverticulosis, so we're, I'm just going to tell you to eat very little fiber. Limit your fiber intake and um, take the first available appointment, and I'll have my office call you. So then his office didn't call for about a week. So I called them and said, what's going on? I'm in pain and, you know, very uncomfortable and this alarming bleeding. And they said, oh, well, the first available appointment is... July 17th. Well, this was June 17th when I initially called him. So I had a month wait and I said, isn't it kind of urgent when you're bleeding that, you know, you want to be seen? And they said, well, you know, he talked to you and he told you what you need to do. Well, by this time I was also feeling extremely constipated and I was very uncomfortable. And like I said, I was in pain at that point. 
And that weekend, it just got to be unbearable, and I called the office back, and I got a different doctor. And that doctor looked at my chart, and he said, you know, I got the on-call doctor. That doctor looked at my chart and said, well, I don't know why the first doctor told you to avoid fiber and consider this to be diverticulosis. He said, I consider, that I'm looking at your chart, and I think this is probably um, internal hemorrhoids that are bleeding, and in order to prevent any further damage, you need to eat as much fiber as possible. And I was like, two different doctors, like 10 days apart from each other, gave two completely different ideas of how to take care of myself until I saw the doctor. And so I was just miserable. I was, and, and I had a friend here from Australia visiting and I was trying to hold it together and show her a good time in the LA area. And we had plans to travel to Solvang. And I just, and it was over 4th of July and I was just, didn't know what to do, it was miserable. So by that point, I had to take a course of laxatives to get things moving because I'd been like 10 days without hardly any fiber at all. And I was miserable sick. So we couldn't do anything for that like tw next 24 hours. And my husband kindly took off some work and spent the day, I think they went to the Getty Center, and um, I was just at home sick. And then we went to the Hollywood Bowl, and we went to Solvang, and we had a, a nice visit. But, you know, there was this underlying current of misery and fear, because I didn't feel like this was internal hemorrhoids or diverticulitis. I felt like there was something that needed to be seen, and these doctors were letting me down. Well, finally, July 17th rolls around. I go into the office. I sit and I talk to this doctor and he says, well, we need to do a sigmoidoscopy. So he, he tells me what the prep is. I go home. I do the prep. I come back that afternoon and he, you know, gets me ready for it. And I had to take a Xanax because I was like strung out. I was like, this is kind of like a little short mini colonoscopy without any knockout drugs. So I took a Xanax and my daughter, who was like 19, 20 at the time, 19 at the time, drove me to this appointment and I'm in there on the exam table. They start this procedure and they get that camera placed and, you know, I see this great, I mean, there's a huge big screen TV in that exam room and I see these beautiful pictures of a healthy pink sigmoid colon everything's looking great. It just is fabulous. And then this humongous on that TV screen, the thing was like this big, which is about a foot. I don't know if you can tell. I mean, if you're watching this on an iPhone, it's probably looks like six inches. But if you're watching this on a 54 inch flat panel, it probably looks like it was three feet, but it wasn't. So on that TV, it looked like it was about a foot. Ugly gnarly, bumpy, black and red and, you know, thing. And I said, what is that? In the meantime, the doctor's going, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, what is that? And he said, it's a tumor. So there was no real like jump to, oh, you know, transition from, oh, this is a hemorrhoid. This was just flat out there, big screen color picture of this thing, right in my face, you've got a tumor. Now, then he proceeds to take um, biopsies of it and he had this little claw device and he's grabbing chunks of this tumor and took about five different um, biopsies and I could watch it, didn't hurt at the time. I, you know, I couldn't really feel anything that he was doing, but, unnerved, completely unnerved. And he's just, you know, I'm so sorry, being apologetic. And and in retrospect, I'm like going, well, is he sorry he didn't see me earlier? Is he sorry I have a tumor? Is he sorry, you know, I, I mean, I was just in shock. So they take me back into the recovery area and I'm crying. I have a tumor and they go and get my daughter and my daughter comes and sits with me and he comes out to talk to me and he says, I'm referring you to my surgeon and uh, 
this guy is really good and you're probably going to have to have a um, ostomy bag maybe for life because this tumor is very low in your system and it may, you know, it needs to be surgically removed and you're probably going to have to have chemotherapy, possibly radiation, but I'm going to refer you to a surgeon and a medical oncologist, or you, you need to see a medical oncologist and everything is just going chop, 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 really, really, really fast. After a month long delay where he couldn't fit the time in to see somebody that was bleeding. And another thing, this, this tumor is a, a very rare form of cancer and it was, it was discovered, you know, I, it, it was, I guess it was one report said it was five centimeters and another report said it was three and a half. So I don't really know which one of them was a PET scan or CT scan. And the other one was his, um, examination of me. And I don't remember which one's which, but I was still hopeful that, you know, this was early stage and I had had a colonoscopy, um, two years before. And the colonoscopy had found a precancerous polyp. And I think it had found one precancerous and one non-precancerous polyp. And the, the recommendation was to come back in five years for a colonoscopy. Well, this was, you know, two years later and I have a tumor. So I was like, what the heck? You know, was something missed? Was Well, it's a different form of cancer. It's a faster growing form of cancer. And so colonoscopies, you know, don't detect everything. That's another little tidbit of information here. There's different cell structures, like for different cancers that can lay flat against the wall of the colon. And it's not a polyp. The, the precancerous lesion or, or skin is just barely detectable. So... Anyway, that's a cautionary little thing there that not all cancers are detected by um, a, colon a colonoscopy early. So if you have any symptoms, if you're bleeding, if you're constipated, if you have pain, go see your doctor as soon as possible. Because, you know, if I'd have been paying attention, I, th I, I was constipated for probably months and I thought that, oh, well, it's diverticulitis or diverticulosis, I think is the technical term. I think it's diverticulitis if it gets inflamed. If it's diverticulosis, if it's not, that could be backwards. But anyway, I thought, oh, I've got these other issues. I'm getting older. I'm past menopause. I need more fiber in my diet. So I was like taking those little fiber gummies. I was eating more salads and more, you know, but I guess I was having symptoms that should have been, you know, taken care of by a doctor. And I was just self-treating. Don't do that. If you think you have a, you know, if, if you're abnormally constipated, and sometimes it sneaks up on you. Like mine was so gradual, I wouldn't have known that it was a, a problem. You know, I was just like, oh, okay, I'm getting older. And that's just that. And that's not a pleasant examination anyway. So nobody really wants to go in, but go in, see your doctor. So when I, he bombarded me with all this information, my husband happened to be out of town. I go home, Carrie drives me home, and poor Carrie, she was just um, an angel, uh, my daughter, and she drives me home, and I am freaking out. You know, I'm just like, I'm trying to hold it together for my kids, but I am internally just a total mess. The next morning, it's summertime, the next morning I wake up and I'm just sitting on my bed going, what the hell do I do? You know, I'm in the LA area and there are literally thousands of surgeons, thousands. And I'm thinking, okay, this guy didn't catch this thing. This guy put me off for a month, my gastroenterologist. I'm not so sure I want to go see his surgeon. I, my confidence was shaken at that point And I thought, I don't know that I want to see his surgeon. I think I want to find another surgeon, but how do you do that? There's thousands of them. I mean, it's not like you can go to Yelp and read a review on a surgeon. You want, you want, you know, word of mouth. You want somebody you can trust. You want the best of the best. And I'm sure they're here in the LA area, but how do you find the best of the best? And the old adage is, what do they call the doctor who graduates at the bottom of his class? Doctor. So I didn't know what to do. And I suddenly, I'm sitting in my bed and I'm crying and I'm like, just 
kind of at a standstill, frozen, don't know what to do. I'd looked on the internet for surgeons, was just totally intimidated. And I remembered this friend of mine who had had um, cancer years ago, and I called her. And I said, um, I told her what had happened, and, and I said, I don't know what to do. I'm just at a loss. I'm my, you know, I don't know what to do. And she said, Lisa, I am going to take care of this. I'm going to come up with a list of names. She said, I have a network of friends who have also have, have had cancer and I have been treated and she had um, stage four melanoma and she had been told back when she was diagnosed that she had, you know, three months to nine months to live. And here it was at that point, it was 15 years later and she was still with us. And I was like, okay, I trust that she found some good people to put on her team. So she called me back a little while later, and the name she gave me was um, Dr. Bilchik in Santa Monica. And he turned out, she didn't remember it because it was 15 years later, and you do have such a thing as like chemo brain, but he was her surgeon on her stage four metastatic tumor. And I was like, well, heck, you're still here 15 years later, and they gave you like a three month, you know, three month lifespan. So he's my first call. So I called that surgeon's office and I got in to see him and um, I was supposed to see him the next Monday. This is like Tuesday at this point. And, you know, in the meantime, I'm waiting for biopsy results to come back. I'm also calling my primary care physicians and getting a surgical referral from him. And I made that appointment and saw that doctor. And then just out of fairness, I did go see um, my gastroenterologist surgeon, but I, I did not choose him. Um, so Wednesday, Wednesday, I think I talked to the doctor's office and they said that the, that the, um, biopsy results would be in on Thursday. So, I was anxiously awaiting all day Thursday for biopsy results, and I had to go to get a CT scan. So I, I went and got the CT scan, I think on Wednesday, and I was waiting for the results from the CT scan and the biopsy. And on Thursday night at about six o'clock, while I'm standing in Ralph's grocery store with my daughter, who was 14 years old at the time, different daughter of four daughters and a son. So yeah, lots of kids all adopted. Whole nother story. If you're interested, post in the comments below that you'd like to hear that story and I will do a video on it. It's a long story. Anyway, I'm in the grocery store with my youngest standing in the canned food section and my gastroenterologist calls me and he says, um, I've got good news. This is not a cancer that, that it is it is malignant, but it's not a tumor that responds well to surgery or um, to surgery, period. It responds best to chemotherapy and radiation. So you probably won't have to have an ostomy bag. And I start to cry because I've just found out I have a malignant tumor. And he's like, well, what's wrong? I thought you'd be relieved. And I'm like, you know, I was still hoping that this was something else. I still had a glimmer of hope that this was non-malignant, that it was some benign thing that could be removed. But no, now it's rock solid malignant tumor and I am headed down the war path. And I said, well, I have an appointment with a surgeon in Santa Monica on um, Monday and I would like to have all the reports emailed to me um, the biopsy results and the um, scan results, if you have them. He said, well, I don't have the scan results yet. I should have them tomorrow morning, but I will email you these copies of what I do have tonight when I get home. I'll just send it. I gave him my email address. Friday comes. I don't have the information. And so around 10 o'clock, I called my friend, the the lady who had given me um, Dr. Bilchik's name, and she said, call him again. So I called him again and I called her back and I was talking to my sister during this and both, both of these ladies were like, okay, you need to go down there. So this office has an office in my town, in the little community that I live in. And I went down there at one o'clock and they said, oh, well, they're not in this office on Fridays. 
They're in the other office. So I jumped in my car and now I'm mad. So I jump in my car and I drive and I'm talking to my sister the whole way. I drive to this other community and I get there and I go in and I, I tell them I need my um, reports. And they said, we can't give those to you without a doctor's release. And I just about lost my mind. And I said, well, you know, they're my reports and it's my information. It's my biopsy report. I need these because I'm seeing a surgeon on Monday and he's going to need to see this biopsy and see what this is. And I don't have a copy of it yet. And they said, well, ma'am, you know, your doctor is left for the day and we can't. And then I just started to cry. And I said, I said, you know, I came in here two years ago and I was told to come back in five years. Now, the waiting room behind me is full of people. And I, my voice got really loud and really harsh. And I said, I was told to come back in five years. And here it is two years later. And I have a malignant tumor. And I want my documentation. And I want it today. Now, everybody behind me is alerting to the fact that I was told to come back in five years. And it's two years later. Which was my point. It's like, if you're not going to give me my documentation on a Friday afternoon and tell me my doctor has already left for the day, when he told me he'd email me the stuff, so be it. You want to, don't poke the bear. You know, I was mad. So th they said, why don't you take a seat and we're going to go back and see what we can do. So I took a seat and all of a sudden things start hopping because I'm sitting in the waiting room crying and a lady comes out from the records department and she brings me a glass of water and she asked me if I'd like to go back in the back and talk to her. And, and uh, you know, of course they're going to give me my records. They're not that. But I, why did I have to pitch a fit? Why did he leave without taking care of this? So, and I said, you know, I'm also in pain. That biopsy site from Monday is talking to me and I can't, you know, digest and pass anything without excruciating pain. But I want to be able to drive because clearly I'm going to have a lot of appointments coming up and my youngest child doesn't drive and I need to be, you know, carting her places and going to the grocery store and taking care of stuff. And I don't want to be given narcotics. I want something that I can drive through. So they said, well, we're going to have to get your doctor on the phone to take care of that. Meanwhile, they're making copies of these records and um, including my CT scan that I did not know was back yet, but it was and I hadn't seen it. So they get my doctor on the phone and he talks to me and he says, well, you know, what's your level of pain and how bad is this? And I tell him what's going on. And he says, well, we're going to, we're going to prescribe this and what's your pharmacy? And I tell him, and then he says, you need to put, um, my receptionist back on the phone because we need to schedule your PET scan. And I said, why do I need a PET scan? And he said, to check out those spots on your lungs. That's how I found out I had spots on my lungs. He didn't call me into his office. He didn't call me when he got the report and look at it and say, I need to call this lady today because we need to schedule a PET scan before he left for the weekend. He told me over the phone when I came in and I was already upset and in pain in a very offhand sideways comment that I had spots in my lungs. And I'm like, what do you mean I have spots in my lungs? They said, well, you had spots that showed up in your lungs on your on your CT scan. And we need to check them out on a PET scan and see what they are because this could be stage four. And then my heart stopped. And I just, I just, that was it. I was just a mess. And I'd driven myself down there and it was about a 45 minute drive in traffic. So I didn't have a ride home. I was shaken. And I... You know, I was just stunned. So I gave the phone back to the other lady. Um, she told me how they were going to set up this PET scan, who was going to call me. And I left with all my records. And I was just stunned. On Monday, I went to see um, Dr. Bilchik in Santa Monica. And I really liked that office. He was my first surgical consult. Then I that week, I saw two more doctors. Um surgical consults. I saw my primary care, I think, that same week. I had the PET scan that week, and I set up an appointment that week to um, meet with a a medical oncologist, and um, 
So it was just, I think those first, I, I think I posted this on Facebook at some point. I think those first 17 days had something like 20 doctor's appointments. It was just insanity. So anyway, I fired the gastroenterologist. I told myself I'm not ever going to go back and see him again. It's just not going to happen. He's not my kind of guy. He is not professional. He should have, he should have not, not failed to see me when I call bleeding. He could have, he could have said, you know, ASAP, she needs to get in. He could have said, go to the emergency room. He could have said anything other than, oh, I'll have my people call you. And then they didn't call for a week. And then the first appointment was a month out from my first call to, excuse me, to him. And that, I mean, that was, that's just immensely disappointing. When you're looking at stage four cancer, you wonder if that month of time would have made a difference. Would it, would it have made a difference? And it's, it's heart-wrenching. I mean, you're thinking, oh man, you're beating yourself up. And by the way, don't if you've been diagnosed because you can't go back in time and change anything. But you're beating yourself up that you didn't go in and see the doctor sooner. But I had done everything I was supposed to do. I had had my colonoscopy. I was told to come back in five years and it hadn't been five years. And I was eating more fiber and I was told I had diverticulosis and internal hemorrhoids and all this stuff. I mean, I was doing everything I was supposed to do, but maybe had I been more in tune with my body, I would have gone in sooner rather than waiting until I was passing blood. And so you beat yourself up about those things. But when your doctor is standing over you in an exam room and you're extremely vulnerable in that position and extremely exposed, and he's saying, oh my God, oh my God, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. The thought that runs through your mind is, this is devastatingly horrific. I'm going to die. The doctor is so apologetic that this cannot be anything good. And, you know, he's seen tumors. He knows what he's looking at. This is not something that he has never seen before. So that bedside manner and then telling me I was going to need an ostomy bag and then backpedaling on that and then trying to send me to see a surgeon that you know, maybe he was his best friend, a golf buddy. I don't know. Maybe he's good. Maybe he's not. Maybe they're affiliated through some kind of um, medical group or partnership. I don't know. But all of a sudden, I was like, I don't really, I don't trust you. So I don't know that I want to see your guy. And then to wait until I was just, you know, on the phone to tell me it was a malignancy standing in Ralph's. I didn't have a notebook. I didn't have a piece of paper. I didn't have any way of taking notes. I didn't have my questions. I had a list of questions I was going to ask him. And I, all, they were sitting on my bed at home where I thought I would be when I took the phone call. But I wasn't. I was standing in Ralph's. And there you go. And then to tell me the next day when he failed to send me the um, reports over the internet and that, you know, I had spots in my lungs right before a, a weekend. You know, I was just like, this is it. I'm going to die. And, you know, he didn't call me in, he didn't talk to me, he didn't reassure me, he just said we need to do a PET scan. And it was just like, I was like, okay, I'm doing the PET scan and I'm switching doctors because this is not okay. And the other doctor, um, I, I hired a medical oncologist and I went and saw the guy. He seemed like a nice enough guy. And um, he, he gave me um, the information on the protocol that I would need to follow for this particular form of cancer. And... It turns out that this cancer is extremely rare and it responds better to chemotherapy and radiation than it does surgery. So all the surgical consults that I'd had were, were pretty much, plus this failed and I needed a surgeon later, which I was glad I knew who I was going to see in that case. And it was going to be Dr. Bilchik. And I saw this medical oncologist and you know, he gave me this protocol and it said that at stage four, you're supposed to have um, these two drugs to start out with. And at stage one or two, you have these other drugs. And I didn't, you know, he gave it to me, you know, and then he gave me these sheets on the drugs and what they do and the side effects and what can happen. And I didn't read it right there on the spot and asking questions. I took it home. I read it and he scheduled the appointment to start the treatment. And the treatment was going to entail a... Um, port installation. So we had to schedule that. It's a outpatient surgery. And so we were going to schedule that and then have um, the port 
put in, I mean, a, the port would be installed in my chest. You can see the scars here. They did one scar this way to put it in, another scar this way to take it out. I don't know why they couldn't use the same scar, but I'm thinking about maybe getting a little flower, little sprig of flower tattoo, maybe forget-me-nots or something. I don't know. Anyway, maybe when I finally get around to that. But he, he said that we would put this chemotherapy, it would be like a, a pump that I would carry with me. It would be in a fanny pack. I wouldn't be able to really shower very well for five weeks. Be a five week regime with this product called Fluorosil or 5FU is the initials. And um, so we scheduled all these things. And I met with my radiation oncologist and we scheduled the start of radiation. And this doctor hadn't really done his homework with making sure that everything was lined up because this protocol is that you have to have the chemotherapy in conjunction with the radiation. The chemotherapy preps the tumor to be destroyed by the radiation. So, I mean, and this is common in, in um, the more common form of colorectal cancer as well, that that's exactly how 5-FU works and how it works in conjunction with radiation. So I'd set up the start of radiation to coincide with the start of chemotherapy, which he told me we were going to do. And I had called... I was supposed to go to chemotherapy on like a Thursday. I was starting radiation on Wednesday. I go to radiation. They said, have you started chemotherapy yet? And I said, no, I have not. So they got the chemotherapy office, um, this medical oncologist on the phone. And he said, well, we haven't received approval from Blue Cross Blue Shield um, to give this drug. And we need to get that done that needs to be done before we can start it. So I was like, well, what's going on? We've known about this for a week and a half. I don't know why this is happening. And so anyway, I called them and they said, well, we we have to get this approval before we can order the drug. So they hadn't even ordered the drug. And then it takes several days to receive the drug. And I'm like, this is crazy. So I called Blue Cross Blue Shield and I said, what's going on here? And they said, Oh, well, we just today received a fax from the medical oncologist's office and they had put urgent request on it for approval of this. And oh, by the way, um, approval for this drug is not required. They can order it and administer it without um, our approval. It's already on the list of things that you don't have to have a prior authorization for. So now I'm forced to reschedule the radiation oncology appointment wait until they order and receive the drug because Blue Cross Blue Shield that same day gave them the prior authorization, even though it wasn't required. But I had to, I had to take care of all that. I mean, I was just like, plus his office staff was like, I have two forms of insurance. And they said, well, you have to pay your copay before you see the doctor every visit. And I said, well, I have two forms of in insurance. And they said, well, we don't file the secondary insurance. You're going to have to do that. And I said, you're kidding me. I am the patient and I am going to be extremely sick through this. And I'm going to have to collect all of these receipts, go online, download the forms, fill out all the forms, attach all the receipts, make all these copies and copies of the checks that I paid you with. And then I'm going to have to file all this separately plus waiting for the explanation of benefits from my primary insurance. You guys are in the business of doing this, and I'm going to have to take care of all this while I'm sick. Y'all aren't going to just, you know, bill the secondary. And, I mean, I argued with them, and finally they said, well, we haven't had good luck with, and my secondary is TRICARE. So, and it's very, 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 very common insurance. So, I don't know why they were giving me a hard time. But anyway, she said, well, we'll try it. And if they give us any trouble, then you're going to have to take it over. So, I didn't like his office staff. And I was really upset with the fact that... So, I called him and I asked him that uh, Friday, Friday night, I called him. Or, no, I think it was Thursday night because this all happened on Wednesday, and I was really upset, and Thursday, by Thursday, I was like, you know what, I'm calling him. So, I called him during the day, and he didn't return my call until that evening, and I, I had several questions by then. I was like, why did you require this? And he said, well, because sometimes 
they the insurance will refuse to pay it after the fact. And um, I'm like, well, if it's on their list, then he said, we just don't like fighting with them. We just get prior authorization on everything. It's just our office policy. That's the way we do it. And then I said, well, why wasn't it done 10 days ago when we knew what the protocol was going to be? Because I want this beast, this cancer, dead. And he said, well, you know, everything takes time and I have other patients and, you know, it just wasn't feeling right. And then I said, you know, this protocol you sent me home with said that um, cisplatin, which is a platinum-based drug, and it's pretty severe. It, it's the drug that has become instrumental in killing um, testicular cancer. If you read, Lance Armstrong wrote a book, um, I think it's called, It's Not About the Bike, and Every cancer patient should read that. I mean, whether you like Lance Armstrong or not, you should probably read the book because it is a survivor story that's pretty extraordinary. Anyway, that drug was um, developed several decades ago, but it has become instrumental in like literally curing some cancers like testicular cancer. A friend of mine was treated with it, I'm gonna say 30 years ago, and um, he's never had a reoccurrence. And it's just, you know, at the time, everybody, everybody in my family and all of his friends and family probably thought this is it, but you know, he survived. So it's a, it's a pretty harsh drug. It has some pretty harsh side effects, um, including possible kidney and liver damage, but it is the recommended stage four protocol for this particular cancer that I have, which is very, very rare. And it's considered to be an orphan disease because it's so rare that not a lot of research is being done on it. Not, so this, this protocol that is decades old calls for this and not a lot of new research is being done on this cancer. So why not use at stage four, this particular drug? And um, he wasn't planning on, on it. He was gonna use mitomycin and fluorocyl, 5-FU at the start and then give me five weeks of fluorocyl and then mitomycin and 5-FU at the end. And I asked him, I said, why are you not giving me cisplatin at the beginning and cisplatin at the end instead of mitomycin? Because that's what's recommended for stage four in this protocol that you sent me home to read. And he said, because I don't think that you can handle it. It's really, really harsh. It can cause kidney damage and liver damage. And you know, I don't want to do any more damage and I want to preserve your quality of life. So basically, he had written me off as, that's it. And I said, but I told you I want the strongest medications, chemotherapy available because I want to beat this. I want to survive. And he said, well, you know, this, this, Cancer at this stage is incurable. And I had already had a conversation with him about whether or not to, uh, the spots in my lungs did light up on the PET scan. And so I'd already had a conversation with him about whether or not we were going to proceed with chemotherapy or whether or not we were going to proceed with a lung biopsy. Now keep in mind, there's a tumor that's causing me a great deal of anguish every time I go to the restroom. I mean, it is just extremely painful. And the lung biopsy was going to take, you know, a couple weeks to schedule. I was going to have to go see a thoracic surgeon. Then I was going to have to schedule a surgery and wait for that and do the pre-op appointments for the surgery and blood work. Then I was going to have to have the surgery and then there has to be a little bit of a recovery period. And this risk there was a risk of a collapsed lung with the lung biopsy because these spots were very close to my diaphragm. Um, one of them was really, really difficult to reach. And if they go in, they don't just go in with a needle biopsy on something like this. They go in and take the piece of lung. And, you know, sometimes they have to open you up. Sometimes they can do it with a VATS, which is a video-assisted thoracic surgery. And... You know, I said, what happens if I have a collapsed lung from this? And he said, well, you know, we could have a couple week delay on treatment. Now, so now we're looking at like another month. And it's been at least a month since diagnosis, two months since my initial 
uh, phone call. And when you find out you have cancer, you want treatment to start like the next day. You don't want, it, it's unbearably difficult to wade through all of the doctor's appointments and all of the um, tests and, you know, interviews and paperwork. Oh my gosh, the paperwork. Filling out the paperwork at every single doctor's appointment. Even if you're not ever going to see this guy again, you're just interviewing this potential surgeon. You got to give them like a, a history of yourself that's a mile long. So, you know, I mean, it's just like, no, I didn't want to wait anymore. I said, so what happens? And the, and the surgeon, Dr. Bilchik, had said, forget about the lung spots because the treatment they're going to give you to kill the original tumor is going to work on the lung spots. So forget about the lung spots. Just proceed. Start moving. And I trusted this guy. I liked this guy. I trusted this guy. I trusted his staff. It was like four-star treatment compared to like one-star treatment at the comparing Dr. Bilchik's office with my initial gastroenterologist, night and day. And um, anyway, so I trusted his judgment and I said, you know, we're going to skip this lung biopsy and I want the strongest thing you got. So when he told me he didn't think I could handle cisplatin, I was just kind of like, you know what, we're going to go ahead and start treatment with you. Because I know that protocol says, you know, and, and that's probably the same protocol that, that other doctors are going to use. They might use the cisplatin instead of the myomidocin, but they probably will be able to add it later. And I said, you know, um, I, I asked for the strongest. He said, well, I've already ordered the drugs and you're scheduled to start on Monday. And... You know, it's going to be another delay if we use the cisplatin. And I said, well, we're just going to go ahead and start then. He said, I can give you cisplatin at the end if you think you can handle it. I said, I can handle whatever you give me. I want it dead. Give me the cannons. Give me the big guns. I want it dead. And so anyway, I started treatment with him. But... um that following Monday or two, I think Monday was a holiday. And on Tuesday I started, um, yeah, that's what it was. I think Monday was um, Labor Day. And so Tuesday I started the chemotherapy regime and they hooked me up to the pump and it's in this little fanny pack and it goes into your port and you can't get the port wet. You can't get the pump wet. And like you can shower the bottom half of your body, but you can't yet to kind of sponge wash everything else because it's just a big pain in the neck. Anyway, that was on Tuesday, and I was scheduled to go back on the next Tuesday and have the bag of chemotherapy exchanged out of the pump. Because what it does, the, the pump regulates the amount of medication that you receive through your port. And then every week you go in and get a new bag of drugs. They hook it up, and they make sure it's working properly, and then they it continues to pump. And the pump thing is rented. The, the port's installed under your skin. The pump is rented. So I go in, I, I called him that week. I I start feeling bad. I start feeling sick. And I'm like, so Tuesday I got the bag of chemo. That next week, I know that, that same week, Tuesday I get it. Wednesday I saw my um, radiation oncologist and my mouth was really bothering me. And she suggested this stuff called, um, no, wait, that's, no, that's not right. I think I'd gotten the second bag of chemotherapy. Yeah, I think it was on my second bag of chemotherapy when this happened. It's, it's now two years ago, so I'm forgetting stuff. But anyway, he he hooked, up, he hooked up the second bag of chemotherapy and my mouth had started to be inflamed. And my sister was with me. And at this point, I had already scheduled an appointment with a replacement medical oncologist that had been recommended by my um, radiation onco oncologist, who is fabulous. And my radiation oncologist was picked for me by um, Dr. Bilchik, who I trusted implicitly. So it's like, okay, I got this team now. And I'm going to interview this new medical oncologist. Well, I went in to get the bag replaced on the um, pump. And my mouth had these sores in it, which is one of the side effects of this medication. It was in the list of things. And I looked at the, uh, he looked he looked at my mouth. He said, oh, first, the, the, he wasn't going to see me because he wouldn't be able to bill me 
for an office appointment on the same day, because I called over the weekend. I said, my mouth is really inflamed. What do I do? And he told me to rinse my mouth with warm salt water, which I've been doing. And then I said, I need to see you. Can you take a look at it on Tuesday? And he said, well, I need to schedule a separate appointment for that. I said, well, I'm going to be in there already on Tuesday to get this bag replaced. And he said, well, I won't be able to bill for an office appointment the same day as we exchange that bag because you can't come to the doctor twice in one day and have it billable. And I was like, I don't care if you can bill for it or not. I'm already going to be there and I'm the patient and I'm in, you know, the one that's sick and the one that's got pain and the one whose mouth has sores on it. And that's the first available day after a three day weekend. You should see me. And finally, after I said, well, you know what? I'm the patient. You should actually make an effort to try to see me on that day if possible. He said, well, you know, when you get in there, um, tell the office staff that I need to take a look at your mouth and I'll come in and take a look. So I got in there and he, he did step in. He took a look at my mouth and I'm standing up and he's looking at my mouth and he goes, just a minute. And he called somebody else in to take a look and he, he's consulting with this other person. He says, do you think that might be precancerous lesions? And I just felt all the blood just drained right out of my body. I mean, just felt that wash of, because now I'm going, crap, I got a tumor in my rectum. I've got spots in my lungs and now I have precancerous lesions all over my mouth. I'm doomed. I'm a dead man walking. And I told him, I said, I just felt all the blood rush out of my body. And then he goes, well, you know, it could also be, um, oh, what's that word? Mucus, mucositis, I think. Anyway, it's inflammation of the muc mucosal lining of your, of your mouth. And my sister's standing there because she was here trying to help take care of me. And she's like, why didn't he just say that? Why did he say, oh, you know, this could be precancerous lesions and freak us both out instead of, anyway, it totally, totally just sealed the deal on me firing him. I was like, that's, you know, I'd already had an appointment scheduled to meet the new medical oncologist and um, my radiation oncologist had called him a big teddy bear and very thorough and a great bedside manner and very connected within the cancer community. So even if he didn't, you know, know exactly what he should be doing, he would consult with the tumor board and he had friends all over the place at different places. And I was like, okay, you know, he's probably my guy. And indeed I saw him on Wednesday and he looked at my mouth and he said, no, that's mucositis. That's the inflammation. I don't know why uh, the other doctor said that and scared you, but this is, and gave me some suggestions. And I asked him, I said, you know, it, supposing these spots in my lungs are this particular type of cancer, gone metastatic, and that's the assumption, because I looked up the statistics of having two separate primary cancers present at the same time, and the statistics are like, something like 0.05% of cancer patients. I mean, it's just ridiculously small. And um, this cancer in and of itself is only like 2% of colorectal cancers are this. And so I was like, so I've got a really rare cancer. Chances are that I have two cancers, slim to none. It's probably metastatic disease from this cancer. Uh, and I said, if it's stage four, you know, I, I did look, and the, and the statistics are that I have a 15% survival rate past five years. It does say incurable, so maybe the other doctor was just being brutally honest, and I wasn't ready to hear it, so in fairness to him, but it wasn't stated. It was stated in a treatment plan discussion, and that, that was not the place for it. Um, but, you know, maybe, you know, I said, what, what are my odds of being in that 15%? And the new doctor said, you know, you're young, you're healthy, you don't have a bunch of other underlying conditions that would prevent you from being in that 15%. He said, I will treat you as aggressively as I can to make sure that you're in that 15%. And there's really no reason why you can't be. And we are just going to do the best that we can. You know, do not, do not lose hope. And I thought, 
this is my guy. I mean, he didn't say, oh yeah, I can cure you. And you know, oh yeah, you're going to live past five years. He didn't make me any promises, but he said, there's no reason why you can't be. And, um, my religious mentor and godmother, uh, who probably won't mind me saying her name, Virginia, did tell me, you know, why not you? Somebody's got to be in that 15%, so why not you? So when you're sitting there feeling sad and blue, why not me? Why not me? Um, when you viewers who may be diagnosed with um, cancer or some other debilitating disease and you've gone online, which I really don't recommend you do, and look at statistics, um, why not you? The statistics for a disease include the people that didn't make it to the five-year mark. That includes people that died of other things. That includes elderly people that presented with this cancer. That includes people with other issues like diabetes or AIDS or, you know, heart disease or something else that, you know, contributed to their inability to withstand treatment or their inability to survive that long. So why not you? Why not you? Um, very good, very good thing to say as a little mantra. Anyway, I decided I'm firing medical oncologist number one. I'm going with medical oncologist number two. And, um, there's more to that story. Um, uh, I did end up getting just progressively worse and, um, the mouth thing turned out to be a whole nother ball game, but I'm going to leave that as a little cliffhanger for another story and, um, just leave it at that. But I did mention that, um, I was wearing my dad's old bolo tie. And those of you who remember him probably remember this as a bolo tie. He used to wear it to church. He used to wear it on holidays, um, to weddings and things. You have to forgive my beat up fingernails. I've been doing my, my crafting with all my little projects. But, and that beats the heck out of my fingernail. I found out that a Dremel uh, sander will just really wreak havoc on your fingernail if you accidentally hit your fingernail with it. It's like, yikes. But I'm also wearing my mother's um, earrings. And I've become a little bit of a turquoise freak after my two visits to New Mexico and Arizona and Texas this summer. And um, so anyway, stay tuned for more... Um, fun things. I'm thinking about maybe even opening a Etsy store. I have an Etsy store, but I, I don't have anything in it. But I'm thinking about putting an Etsy store out there or a doing some stuff on eBay because just because it might be fun. It'd be like a little a little business. I could like maybe not be retired anymore. That's what I tell people as I'm retired. And a shout out to my wife. I'm going to take a sip of my coffee. I mean, my wife, my husband. The mug says wifey. But a shout out to my husband who brings me a cup of coffee every single morning in bed. And you'd think, oh, he's taking care of her. She has cancer. He's done this for like, I don't know, we've been married 23 years, almost 24 years. He's done this for probably at least 18 or 19. So anyway, I like this mug. I think he bought it and picked it out for me and gave it to me at some point, but wifey. He likes my Olaf mug, which isn't in here, but one of my daughters gave me an Olaf mug and it has a little face on it, a little carrot nose and everything, and he really likes that one. So he looks for it to come out of the dishwasher so he can bring it. But I do have a little mug collection of all the states that I went to from the Starbucks line, which has been kind of fun. Um, anyway, I guess that's it. Um, please Please, please, if you take nothing away from any of my videos, please take away um, becoming empowered to fire a doctor who's not going to fight as hard as you are. Um, it's your life. If you're not going to, if you're not going to fight, that's your choice. Um, if there's limitations on how much you can withstand, then that's nothing that you can really do. There's nothing you can really do about that. But if it's a doctor standing in the way of you being able to fight as hard as you want to and as hard as you're willing to, they don't need to be on your team. They don't need to be on your team. You need to be surrounded by a team of doctors who is willing to um, fight as hard as you are. Give it their all. Bring in the cannons and the big guns and um, make sure you have the best shot at survival 
as you can. I know this is a long video, but um, it's a long story. And hopefully the story will help somebody else who's going through something similar. Fire them if they're not really on your side, if they're not working as hard as you are, because they're healthy. If they're not working as hard as you are, they're not working hard enough. And stay focused and um, ask all the right questions. But truly, 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 you don't have to trust a doctor that tells you that they're not going to work as hard as you are. Get rid of them. And you can do it like I did. Let them start the treatment and then get rid of them. And then keep going the treatment with somebody else. I mean, my husband was horrified. He was like, you're going to you're gonna start chemotherapy and switch doctors? I said, damn right, because I'm not delaying this anymore. And I know that the whoever I pick is going to start off with something similar to that, and it can be switched midstream. They can give me something stronger partway through it. But anyway, um, love to all of you guys. Please like and subscribe. There's like a little thumbs up thing at the bottom of the video. Subscribe. Please share with anybody that you think this will help. Um, it's important. Um, I got so much comfort and so much help and so much advice out of the YouTube videos I watched, and I just want to give it back. I didn't see a single video on YouTube about firing a doctor, which is probably why I feel so passionate about this one. And just a little update, I do have um, eyeliner on. I'll take my glasses off and show you. I have eyeliner on because for some strange reason, my eyelashes started to fall out again. And I'm like, what the heck? Like they were really long for the reunion and now they're not there. So like I have little short ones. So I put some eyeliner on. And then just as a final little hurrah for saying goodbye, I'm going to show you just this little thing right here. Look, 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 looky, looky, look. I can put my hair in a ponytail. I can like go like this and just part it and go. So I'm going to do it for you. Oh my goodness. Looky, looky, looky. It fits in a ponytail. Looky there. Okay. It's an ugly ponytail and it's a tiny ponytail. But it's my ponytail. I could probably do like eight of them all the way around here. I put I put part of it in the back one yesterday, and it was hilarious. But look at those curls. Doesn't that just crack you up? I mean, I had hair straight as a nail when I was a kid. Anyway, I got to pull that out. Wouldn't stay that well. Well, anyway. And I will see you guys later. God bless. Give the glory to God because... Literally, you're looking at a walking miracle. I, I honest to goodness, feel like my mission on earth is not done. I have something to give back, and I'm going to do it because there is really no reason why I should still be sitting here talking. My kids would say, you talk too much anyway, Mom. My son calls me, what is it, loquacious? Loquacious, that's an SAT word. Anyway, um, God bless Stay safe. Take care of yourselves. Go to the doctor if you have any symptoms because it's not worth waiting. And fire the guys that aren't really on your team. All right. Bye-bye.